Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Perhaps animals are not a, a, a regular topic within these four walls, but um, what I'm hoping to do in the, the next sort of 45 minutes or so is to convince you that animals have actually been incredibly important to the history of medicine. But actually this particular um, case study I'm talking about today is part of a, a bigger programme of research which I'm running at Imperial College on One Health in History. And I don't know if One Health is something which doctors are as familiar with as vets, because certainly you only have to open a veterinary journal today to find One Health jumping out at you. This notion of trying to bring human and animal health care back together from what is seen as a long history of them having been pursued by largely separate people, separate professions, separate institutions, which means that the sorts of health care problems and challenges we face today um, cannot be adequately dealt with. So proponents of One Health will point to food security, they'll point to emerging infections, of which 75% will spread from animals to humans, um, to antibiotic resistance, um, to climate change, and say that all of these are threats to human and animal health, so we've got to bring them back together. Well, what our project is doing, and that there's four of us looking at this over a five-year period, so it's quite a big project, is um, to say that actually there have always been connections between human and animal health, it's just that nobody studied them. So um, what we're trying to do is, as I say, is to put the animals back into medical history. So the particular context I'm looking at today is, is pathology in the mid to late 19th century. And pathology during this period, I'm talking about pathology before it became experimental and before it became something that was done in the laboratory. So roughly the periods of 1830 to, to 1880. And this is when stimulated by the developments in revolutionary Paris, um, observational-based pathological anatomy is really beginning to take off in Britain. So this is um, based on observing the disease-related changes in organs, tissues and cells, um, either after death through post-mortems or less frequently in life through surgical excision. And the sorts of gross specimens that doctors are uncovering will largely end up in museums, which are one of the key institutions for medical education and research in this period. Now, this is a period really when um, pathology is not strongly institutionalised. I know Edinburgh had a chair of pathology from 1831, but it was pretty unusual in that. And largely the posts were um, part-time, fairly low status, not well paid... Uh, the same went for curators of medical museums. So within the setting of medical education, pathology as a sort of specialist area didn't really exist until the 1880s and 1890s. But that didn't mean that doctors weren't interested in it. Um, because I think one of the things that, that we tend to forget, because we get so hung up on the rise of experimentalism, is that this type of observational pathology was in its time cutting edge, scientific, and greeted with a huge amount of enthusiasm. And what's more, you didn't need a lot of a kit to do it. All you really needed was a microscope, um, if that. Uh, you did need access to bodies and a place to cut them up. Um, but other than that, pathology was something which really any interested doctor could pursue alongside their main uh, income-generating roles in private practice uh, or, or in the hospitals. So, um, from about the 1830s and 40s, we see a rise of enthusiasm amongst doctors across the UK in this new exciting field of, of pathological anatomy. And one indication of that rising interest is the foundation of specialist pathological societies. <clears throat> 
No, I've just spent the morning in the Edinburgh University Library looking at the records of the Edinburgh Anatomical Society, which was founded in 1833. In fact, it was an Edinburgh Pathological Society because mostly what it was interested in was specimens of gross pathology. And I can tell you there's a lot of animals in there, you know, a lot of animals uh, being exhibited alongside the human diseased body parts. Other societies we see founded in Reading in 1841, in Birmingham 1842, Newcastle and Norwich in 1848, and the one that I'm particularly going to talk about today is London in 1846. Um, I'm, I'm sort of dividing this into two time periods, really because of how that London society approached pathology. Um, until 1880, it was generally a case of sort of ad hoc presentation of occasional animal specimens amongst a much larger number of human specimens. But in 1881 to 91, we see a really dedicated research program on comparative pathology, um, partly stimulated by um, the germ theory and what that implied for connections between human and animal health. And also by um, a huge row that was kicking off in the public health arena by the suggestion that diphtheria in humans could possibly be traced back to cows. So that led a whole range of doctors to say that there was a real need for the more systematic study of animal diseases. Um, and the, the, the Pathological Society of London was, um, began research really on, on the back of that. Um, but before... Um, I sort of look at actually what this society was doing. Um, I mean, the only reason I'm talking about London is essentially it's the biggest. It had 700 members by the, eight, by the 1880s. Um, and there's a huge amount of surviving documentation. Um, basically, it met fortnightly, and all the specimens that were presented were then gathered together and reported on an annual volume of transactions. Um, which is a real goldmine. It basically reveals pathology in action. But I don't think it was particularly exceptional because from what little has survived of these other societies, I think they're essentially doing the same thing. There just isn't the same quantity of data for me to, to base uh, such strong claims on. But um, w one of the, the key problems, I think, to understand you know, what was going on here is you know, doctors are within the context of the Pathological Society of London, were looking at animals. Not very often, it has to be said, we're talking less than 5% of the specimens that were being presented. But I'm going to argue this is still significant when we think about what they're doing with those specimens. Um, so we've got 242 of them all together. Um, I've looked at them all one by one, um, and I think they, they do give us some quite uh, important insights into um, the place of animals in medicine and society, and also how doctors were using these animals to build pathological knowledge. So, as a 19th century doctor, probably making most of your income in private practice, although possibly uh, taking off to a, a hospital once or twice a week to work as an assistant surgeon or as a, a consultant's post. Why would you look at animals? And more importantly, where would you get them from? Um, I think this is a, a really key point. Where are these animal specimens from? Now, it's often said that it was obvious for doctors to look at animals because they were much more readily available than human bodies and there weren't the same ethical issues involved in dealing with them. Now, that might apply when you're talking about anatomy or about physiology, because you could just walk out of the street, trip over a dog, knock it on the head, take it back, open it up, and there was your dog anatomy, there was your dog physiology, you could do what you liked to it. But when it comes to pathology, any old dog will not do. You want a specimen that will display something wrong with it. Um, so, you know, as a hospital doctor, you already had a whole host of dead humans with things wrong with them because they died on the wards. So surely the obvious thing was to go and look at some dead people if you're in a sympathology. Why go and look at animals and where on earth would you get them from? 
Well, um, I've actually looked at all of these 242 case studies and actually tried to work out what these animals were. Um, and what I find, find really interesting is they cover the whole range of the animal kingdom. Um, they weren't just interested in noble, uh, valuable horses, uh, uh, valuable animals like horses or exotic animals that you might find at the zoo, but absolutely everything from farm animals to pets to wild animals. So we find case reports of anything from pet canaries to dogs, cows, pigs, monkeys, bears, lions, flamingos, fish, hares, rabbits, experimental mice, an entire menagerie of dead animals was finding its way into the Pathological Society of London's meetings. I think this really illustrates the ubiquity of animals within Victorian society, as well as the professional and the social settings in which Victorian doctors encountered them. So in many cases, these animals were acquired in the course of everyday life, because for 19th century doctors, everyday life was full of animals. They all rode and depended on horses to pull their carriages and gigs. But of course, horses were prone to lameness and colic and flu and all sorts of other diseases. Doctors and their patients often kept domestic pets. And we do know that sometimes patients asked the doctor to treat the pet while they were there. Despite the efforts of the public health authorities, there were still many dairies and pigsties and slaughterhouses in urban areas, and livestock were readily driven, regularly driven through streets of London on the way to markets. Um, so livestock disease then was much more visible and much more prevalent than today. So to a certain extent, doctors who were interested in studying it did only have to look around them. Retreating to the countryside for their leisure activities, they would hunt and shoot and fish. And by dissecting out their kill, they would sometimes spot interesting pathologies. Animals would be examined wherever the doctors encountered them, in stables, on farms, in slaughterhouses, or they might be taken home for post-mortems within the confines of their, their homes. The interesting parts would be extracted, uh, mounted, and taken along to pathological society meetings. But this sort of ad hoc accidental encounter with the diseased animal wasn't the only source of specimens. They also drew on social and professional networks of supply. So friends and, fun and, and family in the countryside would alert them to outbreaks of livestock disease. Or colleagues in the provinces or in the colonies might post things back to them. And one important source of material was the veterinary profession. Vets would sometimes forward specimens at doctor's request or inform them of interesting cases that they'd met in practice, which sometimes they would actually go out and attend together. Alternatively, doctors would actively seek out the advice of vets who they knew to be knowledgeable um, or consult the veterinary literature. So in fact, one in six of the animal reports of these specimens that you find in the transactions of the, the PSL actually refer to vets or veterinary literature. And I think that's quite a significant finding because everyone who's written on vets in the 19th century has said that you know, vets either had nothing to do with doctors or there was a hostile relationship. Um, you know, vets resented the fact that doctors looked down on them, doctors didn't see how they could learn anything from these jumped up horse doctors, and that there was really, compared to France, where uh, the professions were seen as much more enlightened and much more scientific, in Britain there was basically nothing going on. And I think this sort of evidence really shows that no, um, collaborations between doctors and vets in the 19th century were going on, they were important, and they were, they were informal, they were part of everyday working life. Just one other slide before I move on from talking about sources of animals. Um, two important institutions. If doctors were really serious about looking at animals, there are a couple of places they could hang out and be assured of a very steady source of supply. First of all, the London Zoo, opened in 1828 by the Zoological Society of London. Um, it contained hundreds of rare exotic animals, and the death rate at this time was a staggering 
So if you wanted to look at some dead animals, you knew where to go. And in fact, these bodies were really highly sought after, initially by anatomists, but also in time by pathologists. Members of the Zoological Society who made their interest known could claim access to particular bits, such that the bodies were distributed piece by piece, with one person getting the eyes, somebody else would get the skin, and a third person would get the bones. There were also intermittent attempts to um, perform systematic pathologi pathological um, investigations, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. The second institution, which uh, no longer exists today, is the Brown Institute of Comparative Pathology. This was founded in 1871 by London University, um, using money left from a, a rather sort of eccentric um, benefactor who had um, said that it had to go to, to a sort of animal hospital. Well, the, the university bent the rules a bit, and they founded an animal hospital in conjunction with a research institute. Um, what that meant was that um, if you were interested in animals, you had a, a veterinary hospital there, right on site, um, supplying various uh, diseased animals. There were facilities to keep experimental animals, including experimental farm animals, and there were also facilities for visiting researchers. Um, so several of the more prolific um, presenters at the PSL hung out at the Brown and got their animals there. So, that's where the animals came from. The next question is, who was looking at them? Well, looking at the number of case reports that appear in the transactions, um, what we can deduce is that there's quite a lot of doctors looking at animals not very often, <laughs> such that the median number of animals reported on is one. There aren't many doctors looking at lots of animals um, and building research programs on them. In fact, we have a total of 70 individuals who present animal specimens throughout my period. Um, 46 of them exhibit once, 11 of them twice, uh, and very few um, more frequently than that. Um, and these are doctors. I mean, although the PSL was open to vets, um, I think only seven of them joined in total in the whole of the 19th century. So they weren't particularly actively involved in, in, in the society's meetings, despite working behind the scenes in the, the, the development of these, these specimens. So you could say, well, looking at this, well, you know, how is this significant? This is hardly a research program. Um, this is just a sort of fragmented occasional interest in animals. Well, why I think, think it's significant is because in all of these reports, you never see anybody trying to justify what they're doing. There's no attempt to say, this is why I'm looking at an animal rather than a human. And that, to me, implies that there's just a consensus that animals are a legitimate source of inquiry as, as, as uh, for the medical profession, that they saw no fundamental distinction between disease processes in humans and in animals. Secondly, if we consider that the purpose of the PSL was to present interesting and unusual cases, so it's only really the cream of the crop that end up getting presented twice a week in society's meetings. So beyond that, if we're getting this many in the meetings, beyond that I think there's a whole host of other inquiries going on. Um, so there's a, a far greater number of doctors looking at a far greater number of animals behind the scenes. Well, I think my, my argument that the animals are important is perhaps suggested firstly by the fact that natural history at this point in time was a, a typical gentlemanly pursuit. We know that many doctors grew up in rural surroundings, they had multiple opportunities to study nature, and animals were already incorporated into the medical curriculum through the inclusion of comparative anatomy. That field really developed in Britain in the 1830s and 40s. I think it was particularly important here in Edinburgh. Um, and it became the bedrock of surgeons' claims to be scientists, because it was through the comparison of vertebrate bodies that they drew their general conclusions about structure and function. So going beyond comparative anatomy to comparative pathology, 
wasn't really a huge cognitive leap. Um, especially, I mean, you, you could almost study them in the same body. And that's really what happened at the zoo. You know, if a rare animal died, you would have the anatomists and the pathologists all, all looking at it at the same time for, for different purposes. But there were a handful of doctors who exhibited animals more frequently um, at the sort of higher end of, of the scale. They included uh, men like Frederick Eve and Sam Shattuck, who were museum curators. So it was their job to build those museums, and those museums had animals in them. You know, they're associated with the medical schools. The bulk of their specimens derive from clinical cases, but you still find um, specimens, especially in the bones and especially in the urinary calculi, you find animal specimens in there. And there were two other enthusiasts who, who took advantage of, of the brown, as I um, described previously. But by far the most prolific are these two chaps. Um, and I think with these men we can really see, truly say, that there was a research agenda in comparative pathology. I don't have a picture of Edwards Crisp. Um, but he was responsible for about half of the animal specimens that were exhibited at the society. Um, between its uh, the time it started in 1846 and his death in um, 1882. He was the son of a gentleman farmer and he initially followed a very conventional career as a surgeon in practice while writing papers for uh, medical journals. He then wrote a, a larger work on the blood vessels and won a prize in the Royal College of Surgeons. And that encouraged him to try and upgrade. So he decided he was going to become a physician. He went off to Paris, he went off to Ireland, he came back, he presented himself at the Royal College of Physicians in London, and they rejected him. So he was absolutely outraged. He's already been practising for years. Um, and he sort of joined what was then the ongoing campaign for medical reform and the, the, the multiple attacks that were going on uh, at the, the London colleges at that time. And he even found his own journal through which to, um, um, to, to criticise the colleges. So without his um, membership of the Royal College of Physicians, he wasn't really eligible for a hospital appointment as a physician. Um, so he didn't have access to human bodies. So instead, he carved out a role for himself as an expert in comparative anatomy, physiology, and pathology. He had family in the countryside. His brothers were farmers. He was forever getting told about outbreaks of disease there. Um, he also had um, a whole colony of birds and experimental animals in his back garden in Chelsea, and a personal museum of animal body parts, which contained more than 5,000 specimens at his death. But the bulk of his findings were drawn from London Zoo. In 1851, he was given permission to examine all the animals that died there, and special facilities for that purpose. And he justified this activity by saying that all the great activities in physiology had been made by experiments on living animals in a state of health. But why should not their diseased conditions be turned to account? Why may not brute pathology hereafter clear up some of the doubts and difficulties of our art? On his death in 1882, the Pathological Society of London reflected that so far as this society is concerned, Chris may truly be called the pioneer of the study of comparative pathology. By then, the society had turned its attention to dedicated studies in this field, and our second um, pathologist, John Bland Sutton, was the figure selected to perform that work. He exhibited on 27 occasions uh, in the period 1880-91. He was also the son of a farmer. He'd had extensive training in anatomy as a student, and was working as a demonstrator at the Middlesex Hospital when he was invited to um, help advance the pathological society's interest in comparative pathology. In fact, the suggestion of dedicated studies came from the president of the time, Jonathan Hutchinson, and it led to a, an appointment of a committee in 1881 for the purpose of obtaining, exhibiting and reporting on specimens of diseases and injuries in the lower animals and especially to make use of the material available at the zoo gardens, which is why he's cutting open a crocodile. 
So Bland Sutton regularly attended the zoo to watch post-mortems. In his spare time, he would hang out at the animal and bird cages and try and gather stories about their habits and their domestic lives. Apparently, he performed small operations on the animals, but reported little success because the monkeys became frightened, struggled violently and bit. He was also involved in some experiments on young lions, which at the time were all being born with cleft palates and eventually died of rickets at a, a very young age. Um, so he found that if you actually fed the lioness um, goat flesh and soft bones instead of horse flesh and hard bones, um, you could prevent the cleft palates. Whereas if you fed uh, the young lions cod liver oil and infant food, they would develop normal bones. Unfortunately, the cost of this is about the same as the cost of a full-grown lion, which rather begged the question of whether it was worthwhile. Um, but it does show that his interest extended um, well beyond animals uh, after death to the whole uh, facets of their existence. So these are the people who were engaged in the study. So the final question... I want to address is, well, what was it all for? What for these doctors was the whole point of looking at animals? They had plenty of human bodies there. Um, you know, really, that was what they were, they were about. Their interest lay in human health. What did they think that looking at animals could possibly contribute to the advancement of human health? Well, to try and answer that, I've, I've categorised the 242 case reports into several different groups according to what I can discern from reading the report, what, what the actual purpose of, of presenting them was. Now, there's obviously a degree of subjectivity here, um, partly because, as I've said, doctors didn't feel the need to justify animals. I am having to read between the lines and try and work out what they thought they were doing. Um, but I think we can really identify five um, sort of types of, of sort of case report here. Um, and the vast majority of these animals, as we can see on the left, are straightforward, simple case reports of a particular pathology. Often the findings after death were connected to symptoms in life, which uh, the doctors might have monitored personally, or they might have got that information second-hand from the animal owner or keeper. And you can detect sort of several reasons why they might have wanted to present. I mean, some of these things are, they're just simply weird. You know, here's a duck which, when I cut it open, its crop was full of nails. So I thought you might be interested to see that. Or um, here's a dog that uh, belonged to one of my patients and it ran off in the night and had a fight and it came back with a bite wound and, uh, around the penis and it, it's, its urethra bifurcated. Uh, it developed ur urine retention and died. So here's an interesting case of a bifurcated urethra. So some of these don't have much value beyond the sort of weirdness or novelty. Others, we see um, something being presented because it's unusual for that type of animal. So there was a lot of talk about the time about bladder stones um, and the particular chemical that was um, produced. Um, and so, for example, a, an unusual type of bladder stone for a mouse might be presented, even though that might not be unusual for a different species that had a different diet. Or some are simply presented because um, you know, it, it's an unusual animal. Um, so, you know, Diseased kidneys might not be unusual unless you're a camel, in which case they might be worth looking at. But I think the, the vast majority of these case reports show one of ty five types of pathology. Um, so um, either sort of bony pathology, so broken limbs, malunions, rickets, arthritis, joint diseases. Uh, parasites, tapeworms and roundworms get a lot of attention. Uh, as I say, bladder stones um, are, are um, a topic of, of great interest. Tuberculosis especially, tubercle, tubercle, um, is, is presented frequently, and cancer. Uh, 
Now, I think it's sort of significant that those five types of pathology are also the five types of pathology that your surgeons and physicians are most concerned with and most likely to encounter in day-to-day -day practice. Um, surgeons in particular, um, you know, mostly what they were dealing with was you know, accidents, broken bones, people getting run over, tumours they could cut off, bladder stones they could cut out. Um, those are the pathologies they encounter most frequently, and those are pathologies they're seeking to learn about, um, obviously in a lot of human specimens, but also in specimens of animals. And I actually suspect that in these cases, it doesn't actually matter that it's an animal. Um, doctors have simply found another example of a pathological process that they are directly concerned with. Whether it came from a horse, a camel, or a mouse, the pathology was essentially the same as that encountered in humans. So what they are comparing is the normal and the pathological, not one species to another. As I say, these are the sorts of specimens that then end up in the museums of medical schools. Again, suggesting that medical students have something to learn from looking at bony pathology in the dog because it's just bony pathology that just happens to have come from a dog. To go back to the other four categories I have here, um, pathological anal analogy. Um, you see a lot of analogies between different diseases drawn in the middle of the 19th century. Um, it's a much used term at the time. And because pathologists are overwhelmingly concerned with, 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 with the process of disease, with the changes to the tissues and the organs, they draw all sorts of analogies that today we would see, see as a bit weird, a bit strange. Um, for example, um, swine fever and cattle plague in animals were being discussed in terms of their analogy to typhoid fever in humans, um, largely in terms of things like um, ulcers and in the intestine. You know, they're, they're common to all these diseases, so all these diseases are, are sort of not identical but similar, and therefore you can learn something from studying them alongside each other. Um, sheep pox and smallpox and cowpox are, are other examples uh, of the, the pathological analogy. Um, you get the very, very few cases where um, doctors present uh, the outcome of, of an operation on an animal and, and make claims that something can be learned from this about humans. For example, um, here's a spleen I took out of a dog. It was fairly straightforward. That suggests that it's probably quite straightforward to take spleens out of humans as well. Um, the question of disease transmission, this is a topic which isn't addressed frequently, mainly because there's an epidemiological society of London, and that's where those sorts of discussions go on, and, and I think animals are also being discussed in that setting. But that's primarily where the interest in the transmission of disease between humans and animals uh, goes on. But you still find talks um, within this setting... Um, Things about you know, parasites transferring between humans and animals. Can tuberculosis be spread by inoculation? Um, does diphtheria spread from cows to humans? And if so, by what mechanism? And so on and so on. And then finally, there's, there's the, the overview. And those are, those are the papers which I see as the real sort of... Um, the, the dedicated research products of men like Crisp and Bland Sutton. Um, these are the sorts of papers in which they will go through a range of organ systems in different animals and compare, say, you know, the pathology of the reproductive system, starting with the monkeys, going to the cows, moving on um, down the scale until you, they generally didn't get to invertebrates, but, you know, the birds and the fish would be in there. So a whole sort of range, or, or you know, looking at cataracts across the species, bladder stones across the species. So what we would today consider to be comparative pathology. So I think we can see from this that these human pathologists were thinking about animal disease in several different ways. So I say in some of the cases, it didn't matter that it was an animal. They were essentially looking at a pathology in the belief that it was de facto a human pathology. 
Sometimes they're looking at an animal pathology in the belief that it is analogous, so similar but not identical. Or the notion that um, it, they're looking at an animal pathology because it might be a source of infection to humans. Or because it's a basis for comparison right across the species. And this is, as I say, is particularly the case for, for CRISP and Bland Sutton. Um, and I don't really have time to talk much more about their specific motivations here, but um, as I can say, certainly Bland Sutton was very motivated by Darwinism, and he saw um, his studies partly as, as contributing to a notion that disease was evolving as species were evolving. So what do they get out of this? Well, I think part of what they get out of it, or what they're hoping to get out of it, is something, some really useful knowledge. Some useful knowledge that is useful for the domain in which they work, which is basically with human patients. So whether it's about um, protecting humans from diseases that might be spread by, an spread by animals, or it's about learning about surgical processes, or it's about learning of, of the pathology and the development of diseases which they see frequently in humans, looking at animals can have a utilitarian role. Higher than that, and especially with Crisp and Bland Sutton and one or two others, we see this notion of a scientific goal to comparative pathology. The attempt to draw some universal truths about disease processes, regardless of species. And that you can ally with the goal of comparative anatomy. It's about trying to find the fundamental basic facts of life in health and disease. And as a side effect, I mean, none of these doctors went into this hoping to advance veterinary medicine. Um, but of course, the sort of knowledge that they came up with ultimately was used for that purpose. Because at this time, veterinary research by vets was really not happening. Um, the veterinary schools were primarily teaching institutions. The veterinary department of uh, the government was mainly concerned with legislation, didn't do much research. Vets themselves did not really engage um, with research on the side in the way that doctors did. So um, actually a lot of the findings about animal disease that are important at this time are coming out of the medical profession and finding their way back into veterinary medicine. So to conclude, using the path uh, Pathological Society of London as a case study, um, I've shown that the rising interest in pathological inquiry in the mid-19th century extended to pathology in animals. In a world with strong traditions of natural history, where humans lived, worked and played amongst animals, interest in their diseases was not confined to the veterinary profession, but was also a legitimate pursuit of medical doctors. While the animal specimens presented to the society were never that numerous, their relevance to human medicine was never questioned. Procured from multiple sources, they were viewed in various ways and served multiple medical purposes. I've argued that most commonly animals were used in a sort of ad hoc fashion by uh, doctors interested in learning about particular disease processes. And the ubiquity of animals assisted in that goal because simply by keeping their ears and eyes open, doctors could come across animal bodies displaying pathological changes that were either identical or analogous to the sorts of pathologies they were interested in humans. Meanwhile, by making systematic arrangements with institutions dedicated to animals, a handful of interested doctors could actually pursue more wide-ranging, dedicated um, enquiries um, that were not just about utilitarian knowledge, but also uh, in search of the basic laws of disease. Well, the reports I've looked at um, of the other pathological societies show that, that this approach is not just a London phenomenon. Um, we don't have uh, the sort of case-by-case -case, um, resources to, to look at those societies' activities. But from the occasional reports that appeared in the medical press or, or the survival of limited uh, minutes, we can see that they also are looking at animals in very similar ways. And moreover, in the work I'm doing on fields beyond pathology, I think we can see also that uh, medical interest in animals is there as well in those settings. 
So inquiries into the connections between human and animal health are also featuring in doctors' attempts to explain the rise and fall of epidemics or to tra track the transmission of infection for public health purposes. In this respect, the 19th century was truly an era of one health. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.